you guys here today. And uh, we're going to, before we get started with talking about your winning strategy, I just want to make sure you guys can actually hear me. So if you look on your right side, the bottom right corner, there's a chat function. And if one of you guys could just tell me uh, that I'm being heard and not just speaking to myself, that would be great. And then I'll get this show on the road. Okay, I see Zach is typing. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's all I needed to know. So, nice to meet you guys. My name is Dave Green from ExamPal. Thank you, Ade. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, we have a lot for you here today. We're gonna, we have an hour, all in all, of which I'm going to be speaking for half an hour about the winning strategy to get 700 on the GMAT. And then we're going to switch over. We're going to switch over. I'm just giving you a sneak preview to Maria from Applicant Lab, who's going to be talking about preparing to apply. So it's a lot in this one hour. And um, uh, I'm, for that reason, I'm just going to get this show on the road. And I'm going to get started. Uh, but while we're going, you guys can feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll try and answer them out loud. But if I won't have time, then I'll answer them in the next half hour when I won't be speaking. I'll have time. So uh, this is me. And um, just before we even start, I want to thank you guys for being here with us today. And um, right off the bat, we have a special offer for you guys, just for you guys. Um, if you or you, a few of you are saying you lost sound, can anybody still hear me or is, has everybody lost sound? Um, sound is good now. Interesting. Um, now I'm back. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there. I hope it won't happen again, but I'm going to keep plugging on. Thanks for telling me though. I don't want to speak to myself. It's, uh, no point in that. So. The point of example, really, is that we realized um, we were working in all kinds of other GMAT courses, and we realized that students all over the world are paying too much, and they're paying too much for the wrong uh, product. Um, and the thing is, they only realize that they're paying too much for the wrong product when it's too late. So why does that happen? So do you know that feeling? Um, that you get when someone's trying to explain something to you and, and you just don't get it, right? We, we all, we're all probably familiar with this feeling, right? So imagine now what it's like to prepare for admission, an admission test, such as the GMAT or other, GMAT or other admission tests, really. Um, and in these tests, questions can have up to 10 different possible ways to solve them. And our goal is to find the fastest one. And the thing is, is that students all over the world are bombarded with thousands of practice tips, uh, shticks, and all kinds of shortcuts, which are one size fits all, which are there for everybody. And the thing that, that are really, the thing that we've noticed, just to make sure you guys can hear me right, because I see someone wrote that he couldn't, but uh, someone could just tell me yes, that would be great. Anyway, uh, thank you, thank you. So the thing that we um, um, realized at ExamPal is that there's no such thing as the explanation, okay? I can tell you that when a, when a novice teacher comes to me and you know, shows me a certain problem and tells me, you know, how, how do I explain this question? So my answer is, is a question in and of itself. I ask, to whom? 
to whom are you trying to explain this question? And, and that attitude is really example in a nutshell. Okay, so what we do, we do three things that other courses don't do. We study the way that you think. As a user, we track what you're doing, how you're answering questions, how you're not answering questions, and we fit the course to you. We study the effectiveness of all the different possible solution strategies, and that's the main thing I'm going to be talking about for the next half hour, solution strategies. So bear with me for a second. Um, and we find the fastest way for each user to solve each question. Okay, and this is something that really even a private tutor will have a very hard time to do because a private tutor might meet you once every week or once every few days, but we're with you literally every minute that you're studying from the basics to the hardest ones. We have questions interspersed throughout even when we're learning the fundamentals. And, and, we're, and we're following everything you're doing. So when we offer you a solution strategy, we're not guessing. We're actually measuring um, that it'll help you. And our main really insight is that um, admission tests and the GMAT uh, specifically is not about knowledge, but rather it's about a skill which we call cognitive flexibility. And what is that? Cognitive flexibility is your ability to change the set of tools that you're using very quickly in response to the changes in the data that you're getting, okay? And this is really what the GMAT is all about. The GMAT, the material in it, some of you already know this, some of you maybe are at the beginning of your studies, so you don't. The material in the GMAT is not actually very hard. The, the All the quantitative material there is, is actually high school level. It's stuff you've already studied. Even if you haven't touched it in a long time, you've already studied. What's hard on the GMAT is the time constraint, which is very harsh, and the fact that we keep moving in each question from one subject to the next, algebra here, geometry here, a word problem next, and they're asking us to do different things, and it's very hard to switch gears that way. And, and, and that's one of the main things we work on, and that's also one of the things I'm going to talk about in the short amount of time I have with you guys here today. So I'm going to jump a little bit ahead um, because I want to try and get to everything with you guys. So really the core of our course in example is what we call the palgorithm. What is the palgorithm? So the palgorithm is our insight. That there are three strategies, three um, general strategies that the whole test can be broken down into three ways to solve a question. And the first one is precise. And this is probably the one you're already using or you're already used to using from, from your other studies, from stuff you've already, you already know. Precise basically means doing it the straightforward way, getting to the solution on your own, and then looking at the questions and, and picking the solution that fits the question. Okay, and, and that's fine, but the thing is that there are a lot of other ways on the GMAT that work. Okay, so there's also what we call the alternative uh, approach, which is doing all kinds of things that are gonna get you to the right answer quickly, even in, if you're not exactly sure how you got there, even if you're not exactly sure why it's correct, but you know it's correct. And there's going to be all kinds of tools such as plugging in numbers, using the answers, estimating, stuff like that. And, and the trick is, or the, or the goal is to understand when to solve these, and to use these, that is. And the third tool we call logical. So P-A-L, right? This is PAL, PAL algorithm, and that's what exam PAL means. So now, now you know. And logical means um, using all kinds of logical rules without doing any calculations, um, but seeing the logic of the question, which can often let us eliminate sometimes all of the wrong answers, all the four wrong answers, really all at once. And, it can, and this tool can actually be the most time efficient. So now you may be asking yourself, when do I use each PAL tool? And unfortunately, I don't have an easy answer. If, if my answer was just like, you know, you use the precise for triangles questions and you use the alternative for data sufficiency questions, then maybe this webinar would, would be shorter, maybe our course would be shorter, but it's not quite like that. It's, it's something that you have to decide on a question by question basis. And it depends on two things. The first thing it depends on is the characteristics of the question itself. You have to look at the question and ask yourself, what is going to be efficient in this question? Is there, do I have all the material here for me to just do a quick calculation the precise way and get to the answer efficiently? 
or is there some kind of shortcut here that I can take that's going to be a lot faster? Will it, will it save me time, say, to estimate? Or is there some kind of logical rule? Is there a cue in the question, some kind of word that's hinting that I can use some kind of logical rule? Um, and this will help you understand what fits the question. But the other thing it's going to depend on is your own personal preferences, your strengths and your weaknesses, which each of these tools. So in our course, we don't sell you for each question, this is the way to solve it, precise, that's it. We usually tell you a lot of people solve it this way, but some people solve it this way, and we think you should solve it that way. And the thing is, though, is that in order to answer the second question of what is the right solution tool for you, you really have to become acquainted with the different answer tools. You have to try and actually implement them uh, quite a bit. And that's one of the main, really, goals of the course, becoming familiar and comfortable enough with the different answer strategies in order to be able to make an educated choice which one you're going to use. So this is really um, the main uh, skill that I want to talk with you guys about today. Uh, this is um, what I mean by cognitive flexibility, is being good at using the PAL system. And I, I want to show you guys a few examples uh, and not just uh, make this theoretical. So without further ado, let's look at a question and try and decide together what is the most efficient way to solve it. Is it precise? Is it alternative? Is it logical? So I'm going to show you guys a question now. I don't want you guys to actually solve it. I want you guys to look at the question and try and figure out what is the most efficient way to solve it. So let's read the question. Of the 900 guests that attended a wedding, 36% were women. If 450 men left the wedding, the women would be what percentage of the remaining guests? Okay, I don't want you guys to even look at the answer choices, not even, or you can you can glance at them, but I don't want you guys to, to start solving at all. I want you guys to try and tell me what is the most efficient way to solve this one. Is it going to be precise? Is it going to be alternative? Or is it going to be logical? And you should be seeing on your screen right now a survey where you can tell me what you think, which is the most efficient way to solve it. And if you, if what you're saying to yourself is, wait a minute, that was I, that wasn't enough time. You just showed us the question for a second, and then that's true, and that's kind of the point because these really are decisions we have to make very quickly on the test. If we waste more than half a minute deciding how to solve it, then we've already lost. We have to make the decision quickly in order to be able to solve it quickly and wrap it up and move on to the next question. So just to remind you guys, precise is doing it the straightforward way, the high school way, getting to the answer on ourselves. Alternative is, is using some kind of shortcut. There are a few different kinds. I haven't really elaborated, but uh, I will. And logical is using logical cues. So interesting results. I'm going to share them with you guys now. So um, you guys are pr precise gets a, a plurality, um, but logical also quite a few votes. And alternative, only one of you thought alternative. Um, and two of you were very honest and said, I can't tell. And I, I appreciate that because, to be honest, probably most of you can't tell at this point because I just introduced you guys to these things. But interesting that you guys say precise. So. Let's let's talk about it. So all of you guys, the, the majority or the plurality that said precise, first of all, you're definitely not wrong. It is definitely possible to solve this with precise. And all you guys know a little secret now, it's possible to solve basically every question in a precise way. So let's look how. So we know that 900 guests, of the 900 guests, 36% were women. Okay, so we can already stop there. There's a calculation there waiting to be made. 36% of 900. Let's go calculate that. 36 over 100 and 900, which is we can take out and simplify the both of the zeros. That's 36 times 9. So we'll do that 36 times 10 minus 1. It's a little bit easier. So 360 minus 36. Then we're going to get to 324 women. Now we know that 450 men left the wedding. So the total population of the wedding is 900 minus 450, which is 450. Meaning that the percentage of the remaining guests is 324 over 450, which is all good and well, but that's not a percentage yet. We have to now simplify it. So one way to do that would be to take out 3 as a common denominator, giving us 108 over 150, which we can then divide again into 3, giving us 36 over 50, which we can multiply by 2, 
72%. Answer choice D. So that's one way to do it. That's one way to do it, and, and it works. Nothing wrong with it. However, that could take a little bit of time. I mean, it took me about a minute now just to explain it, and I definitely wasn't really doing the calculations. I was just saying them. By the way, I'll just say now, if this is a little fast for you guys, don't worry about it. You will get the recording uh, emailed to you afterwards so you can at your leisure approach this, these questions and solve them and, and try different tools. So don't feel um, stressed. Um, just try and follow along with, with uh, my logic. So as I'm saying, this can take a while. And the five of you that guessed logical, you were maybe on to something because that's also possible. And, and let's see how. And let's see if it, if it works. So this is a percentage question. We're being asked the women are what percentage of the remaining guests. And percentage is, right, by definition, part over the whole. So let's think about what the part and the whole we're being asked about here are. We're being asked about the percentage of women out of all of the guests. But we know what the percentage was at the beginning, right? We're told that explicitly. In the beginning, it was 36% of women. And then 450 of the guests were well, men, but of the guests left, that's exactly half, right? 450 of 900 of the guests left. So the percentage we're being asked to find is the same number of women, whatever it is. We don't have to figure out the number, but it's the same number of women divided by half of the guests. And that means that the percentage is going to be twice as much because we're dividing by half. We're dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. And if it's not clear what I just said, that's okay. It's another logical rule that we need to be acquainted with. So the percentage is just going to be twice as much. So we're going to go from 36% to 72%. And that's the solution. And that's it. We don't have to know what the actual number, the absolute number is at all. We can completely skip over that. And I think you guys will agree with me that this was quite a bit faster um, than the precise solution. And, and this is an example, right? So it's not the case. This is not to say that all questions should be solved the logical way. Sometimes it's not possible at all. Sometimes it takes you know a great deal of insight to see the logic. Um, and sometimes precise is just going to be very easy and there's no reason to do it. But this is an example of a question where it is. And what you see now on the screen is, this is these are the types of measurements that we do all the time on ExamPal. We, we see uh, how long it takes for people to solve according to what uh, solution they chose. And here it's very clear that um, whoever chose the logical, on average, it took them less than two minutes. Uh, to remind you, on the GMAT, we have two minutes on average for the quant. So this means it took them an, an acceptable amount of time, whereas whoever tried the precise, it took them on average two and a half minutes, which is longer than we want it to be. It's, it's, it's clearly longer. So I hope that was clear. You guys are welcome to ask me any questions about that, but I want to keep moving because um, I don't have much time, and I, I want to share with you guys um, another example. So actually, I want to go and look now at a verbal example just to prove to you guys that it's not only it's not only quants. Uh, although I hope I hope I convinced you that it, that the PAL system works for quant. But now let's look at a verbal example. And again, I want you guys to be asking yourself what is the most efficient way. So the interview is an essential part. This is of course a critical reasoning question. The interview is an essential part of a successful hiring program because. With it, job applicants who have personalities that are unsuited to the requirements of the job will be eliminated from consideration. This argument depends logically on which of the following assumptions. Once again, I don't want you guys to actually start solving. In this case, I really don't want you to even look at the answers. But just look at the question one, one more second, and that's all the time I'm going to give you. Um, sorry. And now I'm going to show you guys another um, another survey I want you guys to fill. How do you think we should solve this verbal question? I know you guys didn't have much time. Still, I'm interested in hearing your opinion. I'm going to give you guys another five seconds. Interesting results so far, actually. Not quite what I was expecting. So um, I'm going to give you guys maybe 10 more seconds. Um, to tell me. Uh, okay. So our time is short. Let's see what you guys voted. So first of all, definitely 
the main result here is that none of you think the answer is precise, which is interesting because we haven't actually talked about what what precise even means in verbal, but maybe you guys are kind of extrapolating from the last quant question where precise wasn't the way to go. Anyway, a uh, majority of you guys thinks, a plurality I should say, thinks logical, which was the right answer last time. And a few of you think alternative. And again, there are two honest people that say I can't tell, uh, which I appreciate. So let's talk about it. Um, all right, so let's once again, uh, let's look at what a precise solution actually means in critical reasoning. It's less clear than in quant, I, I, I think. We're not, we don't have numbers to start crunching. So in critical reasoning, what precise really means is um, really breaking down the information in the question stem, so in what we have at the top, not looking at the answers at the beginning at all, but just breaking down the information in the question stem and seeing if we have enough information to try and solve the question more or less in our head. And let's see if we do. So let's start reading. The interview is an essential part. Okay, so we know interviews are essential. What are they essential for? Well, we're told because, okay, that this is an important word because this is a, a key word that's indicating the connection between the parts of the sense. So the interview is an essential um, part of a successful hiring program because with it, job applicants who have personalities that are unsuited to the requirements of the job will be eliminated from consideration. So summarizing, which is something we should try and do when we, when we uh, solve critical reasoning questions. Summarizing, we, we see here that interviews are essential because they eliminate unsuitable applicants. Okay, so now we can ask ourselves, what does it logically depend on? What does this argument logically depend on, right? So what does it logically demand, depend on the claim that interviews are essential because they eliminate unsuitable applicants? So one thing that I think it pretty clearly depends on is the assumption that they indeed do, right? We're saying they're essential because they do this thing, so we need to assume that they indeed do eliminate unsuitable applicants. And now, with this information in hand, we can go and look at the answer choices and see if there's any answer choice that, that says something like this. So A says a hiring program will be successful if it includes interviews. That's not what we just said. B says the interview is a more important part of a successful hiring program. That is the development of job description. Also, not what we just said. C says interviews, interviewers can accurately identify applicants whose personalities are unsuited to the requirements of the job. And that is basically what I just said. This is telling us, this is not talking about uh, why, why it's important or something or, or a condition. It's actually giving us information saying it, it can actually do this. It, it, it has the ability in fact to actually achieve this thing. Interviewers can accurately identify. So for that reason, actually here, the precise solution was efficient. Now, just for all of you guys that guessed alternative, then I think it's interesting to talk about that here also, because what would it mean alternative uh, in this type of question? So I think what it would mean it would be to use the answers, to go over the answer choices and try and eliminate them. However, the, the thing is, is that um, whereas in quantitative, alternative solutions can be very, very time-saving. Uh, we, we haven't seen an example so far, but, but on the course, there, there are plenty. This is one of the main tools we teach. In a verbal, actually, uh, going over the answer choices can be quite confusing. The reason is, it, first of all, it can just waste a lot of time, but, but aside from that, it can be quite confusing. The reason is, is that a lot of the answer choices are not actually wrong, per se. They're just not the right answer for the question being asked. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look here. If I were just to start reading the answer choices, so let's read the first one. A hiring program will be successful if it includes interviews. So this sentence... In and of itself, it makes sense. It's not a wrong sentence. In fact, it's almost certainly a right sentence. It's actually, it makes, you know, it's a very logical sentence. And, um, and, it's, and it's hard for me to eliminate it just by looking at it. However, it's not a good answer to the question we're being asked. The argument does not logically depend on it. But that's kind of a hard leap sometimes to make. And, and, and this is often the case when you read 
the answer choices, they can really take us in all types of directions and, um, and be uh, quite confusing. Um, so um, I want to keep moving. This so so, uh, so far we've talked about the algorithm, um, precise alternative and logical tools we can use, and this is as I mentioned one of the really main things we teach in example on the course, both what these strategies are, how to use them, and how to decide when we want to use which one. And in the few minutes I have left before I hand it off to Maria, I want to just very briefly talk about another important tool that we see this, that high scores, that 700 plus scores um, use. And this tool is what we call a uh, rapid improvement. So this little graph here is kind of a typical graph of, of a student's improvement. And what you see here is that in the beginning, Things are looking pretty good. Improve as time goes on, results get higher, and, and it's a pretty exciting place to be. However, at a certain point, you reach this plateau. Time goes on, and the results don't get better. And this happens to a lot of students. Really, it's it's very. This is this is the rule. This is not the exception. And high scorers are often the ones that manage to break out of this and keep improving. So. And what I mean by that is this happens to students when you're done actually studying the material. Once you, when you're learning the material, when you're learning new things, it's very natural to improve. But at a certain point, you're going to know all the material. You will have reached your natural kind of limit of speed of how fast you can read and how fast you can calculate. And at that point, improving requires other things aside from all the stuff I just mentioned. So what does it require very quickly? It requires a few things. It requires realizing that mistakes are opportunities and really researching and learning for your mistakes. So it's very natural to make a mistake, say to yourself, uh, you know, bummer, but let's keep moving and the next one I'm going to get right. And then when you get one right, you feel good and, and you kind of try to forget about the one that you got wrong. So it's natural, but it's actually not the best approach. The best approach is to back up and ask yourself, wait, 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 what happened here? Why did I get it wrong? Was it something to do, was it a professional problem? Did it have something to do with the material? Did I just not know, you know, how the Pythagoras um, theorem works? And if I didn't, okay, I have to go back and I have to learn it. Or was it something technical? Was it something silly? Did I just mix something up? And, you know, this is, these are the types of mistakes that you do them and then you say to yourself, ah, that, that doesn't really count. That was just a silly mistake. I knew this. I, you know, I know this material. But actually, these are the ones that are, I think, the most important to to, to not shake off and ask yourself, how could I have avoided it? Because oftentimes, it's very possible to avoid them. You can just think of just a really simple techniques like, you know, just writing the answers down, eliminating the answers one by one, stuff like that can really help you avoid mistakes. And is it a strategic problem? By that, I mean a problem having to do with, you guessed it, the PAL algorithm with it, which I'm, I'm, I'm solving things with the wrong PAL way. I'm solving them precise when I should be going logical or the other way around. And if that's the case, you need to work on your PAL skills. Um, so really quickly, this is kind of the outline of what we think a winning study plan looks like. So the, the amount of time we recommend stretching it out over is six to eight weeks, and about 120 hours in total, including everything. Which, if you break it down, is not that much. That's about 60 hours per month. It's about two hours per day on average. So even if you're working a full-time job, this should be possible for most of you. And uh, this includes um, 20 hours going over the intros, which on example is the videos in which we teach you the fundamentals. 20 hours going over the lessons, which are videos in which we teach you the PAL system for each and every topic. So we show you how precise alternative and logical relate to, say, for example, fractions and percents, and also each uh, all the other topics. 30 hours for our algorithm practice system. So you, you, you practice, you, you solve questions, and then we give you feedback on which PAL that you're using, which we think you should use. Another 30 hours for practice tests for GMAT CATS and using the official guide. And another 20 hours for improving your verbal abilities by reading from the newspaper, 
or uh, stuff like that. And if you're a non-native speaker, then add another 30 hours to that. Make that last part 50 hours, which will make the whole thing 150 hours. So just to summarize, guys, the winning study plan that we uh, that we recommend is, um, or I should say, the, th what, the answer to the question, how do you become a 700 plus scorer, is using cognitive flexibility, is mastering rapid improvement, and is building a winning study plan. And, and the main thing I want to leave you guys with is that these three things are not intelligence, and they're not knowledge, and they're not anything that you're born with. These are tools. These are tools that you can acquire. It doesn't mean that everybody will get you know, an 800 score, obviously, but these are, are all tools that can help each and every one of you improve to your personal uh, highest possible score. So I'm going to hand it off now to Maria, and I'll be back at the end um, to speak to you guys shortly again and also to answer questions. You can also ask me in the chat um, while we're going. So um, in the meanwhile, I'm going to hand this off uh, to Maria. This is uh, her part. And, um, I think I hear her now. Okay, yeah, great. Dave, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, guys, can you can you hear me? If you could just type again into the chat box at the bottom just to make sure because I also don't want to I also don't want to start taking off and clicking through my slides and then I realize 5 minutes later that you can't hear me. Okay, wonderful. Sounds like sounds like I am ready to go. Um so hi everyone. My name is Maria. I'm a 2005 graduate of Harvard Business School and I'm also a member of the elite admissions consulting organization known as AGAC. Now, I started giving admissions advice when I was a student at Harvard. And after I graduated, people that I had helped during my days at HBS would refer their friends to me. And then those friends would refer their friends to me and so on and so forth. Until eventually I was spending all of my free time when I wasn't at my day job, I was spending all of my free time helping people apply to business school. And one day one of those people said to me, Maria, I know that you have a day job in product management and that you seem to like it, but whatever it is that you do, you should probably quit that day job and just do admissions full time because you're really good at it. So I thought about it. Um, and I started researching the traditional admissions consulting industry, and I quickly came to the to the sort of startling realization that most admissions consulting companies charge between forty five hundred U.S. dollars to sometimes even twenty thousand dollars and above. And discovering this, you know, I need to be honest with you, it really bummed me out because I didn't feel that I could justify charging that much money for what I know. After all, I love giving admissions advice. Um, and so why would I why would I try to charge so much from people uh, just to give them this advice that I love to give? So then I had this sort of happy eureka moment though, because I remembered, wait a minute, Maria, you're a product manager. Why don't you combine your expertise in digital products and your passion for admissions together to disrupt this industry? And that's exactly what I'm doing. I am the, the founder and the CEO of a company called Applicant Lab. And what Applicant Lab does is it takes exactly the same process and the same advice that admissions consultants want to charge you thousands of dollars for, and it breaks it down into an easy step-by-step -step digital platform that's available 24-7 on demand at a much more reasonable price. It's actually less than 300 US dollars. So what the lab does is it breaks down the very complicated and stress-inducing uh, application process and gives you a series of steps. It tells you exactly what to do and when to do it, and that eliminates that sort of going in circles feeling that a lot of people get when they sit down to write their applications. It can either completely replace the need for an expensive admissions consultant, or it can save you thousands of dollars should you choose to work with a traditional consultant. Because what you can do is, instead of needing to buy one of their expensive large packages, what you can do is you can use Applicant Lab first, and then only buy a few hours of their time. And then what you do with that is that you still end up getting, you know, that advice from from that other admissions consultant, but you've just saved yourself four thousand, six thousand dollars or more. Um, it is the only admission service that is endorsed by the Harvard Business School student newspaper. And I could spend some time right now walking you through all of the different features and benefits of Applicant Lab, but we are so pressed for time that the only benefit or feature I'm going to leave you with is the fact that Applicant Lab works. What I want you to do after this webinar, not now, 
<laughs> but after this webinar, please go to GMAT Club and check out. I have over 75 star reviews. People for the past few years have been posting reviews. Um, you know, here it says message board said I had zero chance and I got a full ride. Here's a reapplicant who was accepted to Columbia with a fellowship. Applicant Lab helped me get into my dream school and et cetera, et cetera. There are many more stories just like this from people who are just like you. So with that introduction out of the way, let's get down to what we are here to talk about. And that is how can you spend the next six to nine months preparing to submit the perfect application? In case you're not familiar yet with the uh, business school scheduling and the deadlines, how it works is that B business school admissions is divided into three rounds, but I don't actually advise that you apply in round three. So for all intents and purposes, there are only really two rounds of business school deadlines. The first round of deadlines tends to fall in the September to October timeframe, and the second round of deadlines tends to fall into the January timeframe. So that means that you still have about six to nine months uh, before these applications are due. And you might be asking yourself, well, what can I be doing right now in order to strengthen that application? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. In today's presentation, I'm going to walk you through a number of actionable tips that you can take starting as early as tomorrow to begin ensuring that your application will be as strong as possible. So one of the first concepts I want to cover with you is the fact that schools want to feel loved. They want to feel loved. And why is this? Is this because they are a très romantique, oh la la, hopeless romantics? No, it's because of the very pragmatic concept known as yield. And what is yield? Yield is the percentage of people who are offered a spot at a school who then accept that spot. Yield is important because it really helps the admissions committees not only plan out their class, but it actually plays a role in a lot of the um, admissions, um, the, the rankings, you know, and we all know that the schools really care about their rankings. So if the school has a low yield, it's going to damage its ranking. So here's one of my first pragmatic tips. Until you get accepted, I want you to treat every school in your decision set like it's your first choice school. I don't want you to say to yourself, well, I have the, you know, I'm going to apply to say six different schools and some of these schools are schools I really love, but some of these other schools are my safety schools. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time or attention on those. No, that is the wrong thing to do because if you then, if you don't spend a lot of time and attention on your safety school applications, you might find yourself getting even rejected from your safety schools. This happens all the time. If you spend any time at all on some of these message boards, you'll see people getting into higher ranked schools and getting rejected from lower ranked schools, when that happens, it is probably because they did not convince the admissions officers that they really, really, truly love them. So what can you do starting tomorrow to help show a school that you love it? The number one thing you can do is I want you to sign up for all of their email lists. Every school has some sort of an email list that you can join. Sometimes you need to set up an account um, or sometimes you can just enter in your email address. I want you to sign up for the mailing list for every school that you might apply to. You might not know at this point which schools you're applying to. That doesn't matter. Every school that you might apply to, I want you to sign up for the mailing list. And I don't just want you to sign up. I want you to click on those emails. I want you to open the emails and I want you to click on the links inside of the emails. If those links take you to a blog post or something, I want you to read the blog post or at least scroll through it. Should the school offer something like a webinar, I want you to attend the webinar. And why is that? Here's my next tip. A lot of stu uh, students and applicants don't realize that the schools actually track who is opening the emails, who is clicking on the links, et cetera, et cetera. If six months from now you apply to a school and you write in your essay that, you know, at, at, you know school XYZ is my first choice school and I can't wait to go there, and they look and they see that you haven't actually done anything, you haven't actually clicked on any of the links of their blog posts or any of the videos that they've sent out or what have you, what do you think they're going to think, right? They're going to think to themselves, yeah, right, this person, if we let them in, they'll probably, they probably won't come and attend our school and that's going to damage our yield. No, thank you. The other thing you should do is if you live within, say, two to three hours of a target school, then please try to visit the campus, right? If you live in the same city as a target school and you don't bother to take half a day off work to go visit the campus or to take a day off of work to drive a couple of hours and go visit the campus, again, what signal are you sending to that admissions office? You're sending them a pretty negative signal. Your essay might say one thing, but they're going to actually look at your actions showing the school that you love them or that you don't love them, and that's what they're going to go by. 
The second thing you can do to start to learn uh, how to show a school that you love them is to reach out to current students. Uh, and there are there are a couple of main ways you can do this. The main way you can reach out to current students is through the student clubs. Uh, this is the career clubs. And by that, I mean the professionally focused clubs, right? These are things like the real estate club, the private equity club, the entrepreneurship club, whatever your current uh, industry is, I want you to start reaching out to those students and to those clubs like as soon as tomorrow, right? Because what you're going to do is you're going to reach out to them and you're going to ask them if you if they might have just 10 minutes for a quick conversation. And during that conversation, you're going to ask them questions about the program and the insights you get from those questions are going to help make your application stronger. Uh, the other types of clubs that often exist are these sort of fun clubs or affinity clubs or social clubs. So schools might have something like uh, a rock climbing club or a beer drinking club or a wine tasting club or a yoga club or what have you. So also research those clubs. If you have a particular affinity for any of those sort of more fun clubs, you can reach out to those people as well. The other people you can reach out to, the other current students you can reach out to is you can try to find people who went to either your same undergraduate college or who used to work for your same employer who is attending the school. So you can reach out to those people as well because you have something in common with them, right? Even if they're not in the same, in the sort of clubs that you're interested in, you have something in common with them and therefore you have an excuse to reach out to them. And so what are the benefits of doing this student outreach? First of all, in the application form, you can mention these people. Now, don't exaggerate. If you didn't talk to, if you know, if you end up not talking to a lot of people, don't like just put down the names of people you've heard of that go there. You, you actually only want to write down the names of people that you've spoken with. But in fact, in a lot of schools application forms, there is a little text box that says, how many students have you spoken with from our school? Um, so you are going to want to have something to enter there and not just leave that blank. You might be able to mention or name drop the students that you talk to in your essays, but I want you to tread lightly. I don't ever want somebody's essay to say to be sort of like a laundry list of just like 15 names, right? And then, you know, and then I spoke to John Smith and Jane Doe and Jude, you know, whatever, Smith, uh, you know, like I don't want you to just do that because that's sort of tiring but you might be able to mention them in your essays. You can definitely mention the student outreach should you be invited to interview. The interview is a great place for you to say, you know, yes, I'm so excited for this program. You know, when I was speaking with Jill Smith, uh, who's the president of the Renewable Energy Club, she said, blah, 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 blah. So you can definitely drop that into your interview. But talking to students isn't just about being able to drop their names. It's more about getting deeper insights about the program. These are deeper insights that are things that you could not guess simply from reading the school's website, right? A lot of schools will say, we want you to show, we want to know that you've done more than just read our website. And the best way to do that is through students. So let's say you're trying to write an essay. Let's say a school has asked you to write an essay about what you're going to contribute to the campus, right? Here's something you can write if you've, if you've spoken to students and you've done this homework. I was speaking to one of the co-organizers of last year's Tech Trek, and she said that she wished that they had gotten to visit some solar power companies. Well, I can easily arrange a visit to my company, Solar Co., next year, so that way next year's Tech Trek will be able to do this, blah, blah, blah. So look at how the deeper insight, like this is something I, I might not have known just from the website that the Tech Trek organizer wished that they could visit solar power companies. So this idea of how I can help the campus comes through in talking to students. And so when you talk to students, this is something I want you to, to ask, not just asking questions about the program, but I want you to give them a little bit of your background and then say, how do you think I could be most helpful to the club? Because then that'll, that'll give you fodder for that contribution. Uh, essay. Talking to students is also going to give you a better sense of whether or not that school is a good fit for you. And if you spent any time at all in the MBA admissions space, um, you'll see that this word fit gets thrown around a lot, right? It's a very popular term in, in, in admissions circles. People use it all the time, but what does it actually mean, right? It's kind of a, it's kind of an, you know, it's not exactly a very clear, a clear term. So I'm going to tell you, here's what fit means. Fit can fall along two main dimensions. Number one, are you a good cultural fit for the program? By which I mean, are are you the same, you know, are these people my people? Do you have the same sort of values and personality and interests as other students that are currently at the school? 
fit can also go across the academic or career portion of of your of your plans. Uh, we're going to talk about this more in a second. But some schools, you know, they might be really highly ranked schools, but they might not actually offer the sorts of academic or career offerings that you're looking for, believe it or not. So right now you're saying, okay, Maria, I don't care. I just want to get into the school with the best ranking. Uh, but I would humbly submit to you that the best, that sometimes the, the best magazine ranking is not the best ranking for you personally and what you want to achieve in your life. You know, not so fast. Don't just think about rankings. Uh, the most important part of business school is in fact the network you build. I can, I'm a testament to this. I graduated 14 years ago, um, cough, cough, <laughs> I'm, gosh, I'm getting old. Um, I graduated 14 years ago, and even as, as recently as a couple weeks ago, I was talking to someone who was a friend of a friend who was giving me business advice. Um, so you're going to want to go to a school where you get along with the other people because that's how you build a network, right? You build a network by, well, getting along with people. So if you go to a campus where there's little fit, you're giving up a big part of the value of business school because you're not going to be making those strong friendships that are going to help you in the years and decades to come. And by the way, demonstrating this fit really helps you get in. So let's look at an example of sort of an academic and career fit. Let's say that you are interested in applying, or sorry, in applying to and in eventually working in the real estate industry. So here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the number of electives in real estate that one very elite school offers. You'll see it's three electives. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have other electives in real estate that another top school offers. You'll see this school offers 11 electives, and it not only offers a greater quantity of electives in this space, the quality and the depth and the breadth of education that you're going to get is so much stronger. So as a result, you, you know, if you wanted to work in real estate, which school is actually the better school for you? Which school is going to give you that those tools and that knowledge so that when you get that job out of business school, you're going to be successful in your career. Guess what? The school on the left is Harvard and the school on the right is Columbia. Most people are shocked when, when I give this present. I give this presentation live um, in front of groups of people sometimes. And, and when I say this, I can sometimes hear an audible gasp uh, in the room. If you want to work in real estate, and this is just one example, I would humbly suggest to you that Columbia is actually the better school for you than perhaps HBS, or at least it's on equal footing in terms of, wow, look at how much it offers you. So here's my next tip. One of the ways that you can research fit isn't just talking to students, but it's actually researching the electives that a school offers and looking at the clubs and how active those clubs are to get a sense of fit. After all, Columbia would not offer 11 electives in real estate if there weren't a huge number of students in that program that were interested in real estate. And they wouldn't have like the real estate conference if there weren't a huge number of students who were interested in real estate. That means that they're gonna have, if they have a lot of students that are interested in real estate, guess what? That means they have a lot of alumni who are interested in real estate. And if they have a lot of alumni who are interested in real estate, those alumni can help you in your job search later on. So make sure to look up the electives as well in your intended field of study. There's another type of outreach I want you to think about doing, and you can start doing this in the next sort of days and weeks ahead. Um, most schools want to know, not every school, but most schools in the application want to know what your career goal is in the long term. That is sort of, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And also in the short term, right, immediately post MBA, they're going to ask you some sort of an essay question about, you know, describe your career vision and why school is the right school for you. Um, so here's here's something that here's a tip that a lot of people might not necessarily know. The admissions officers, if they have a candidate that they like, right, a candidate that is otherwise pretty strong. But if that candidate is applying with a career vision that really does not make sense, the admissions office will go down the hall and ask their peers in the career services office if your vision is feasible. If career services looks at your application and your background and says, <laughs> there is no way this person is getting a job in private equity, <laughs> LOL, guess what? Even if you're a super strong candidate with a 790 GMAT and a whatever GPA, like you're not getting in, right? Because admissions officers want to make sure that your career 
uh, vision is one that is realistic. So they want to make sure that you're going to get the job that you say you're going to get. Why is this? Because they want you to be happy when you graduate. They want you to be happy because, first of all, admissions officers, contrary to what you might think, they're actually really nice people. <laughs> so they want you to be happy. But also, uh, alumni happiness surveys also play a big role in some of the rankings. So that is why when you write your, your career vision essay, your career vision that you apply with has to be something that is realistic. It also has to be something that is inspiring or, or interesting in some way, something that makes people lean forward. Um, you might understand that there's a certain opportunity that is really exciting in your field, but realize that most admissions officers don't come from the world of business. Most admissions officers prior to working in admissions, they worked in HR. So they might not understand the, you know, the potential for something like solar power to really transform your industry, or they might not understand that apps are completely radically transforming the real estate industry. So it's up to you to paint this inspiring picture about how your career vision is going to take advantage of some, you know, really fascinating long term trend. You also want your career vision to be as unique to you as possible. And here we have the little, the little section in Applicant Lab. I have an entire section devoted to helping you come up with a strong career vision. Now, you might be saying, but Maria, I want to be honest when I apply, right? I'm going to, I'm going to apply. You, you were making fun of a few minutes ago of somebody applying with a private equity career vision, but I actually want to work in private equity. So that's what I'm going to write in my essay because that's what I actually want to do. Um, I mentioned private equity specifically because that's one of the most common things people want to do, and it's actually almost impossible to get a job in private equity if you have not already worked in banking. So here's my tip to you. My, my tip to you is honestly apply with the strongest career vision possible, and then once you get in, that's when you can explore private equity or you can explore hedge funds or you can explore whatever you want. This is a very pragmatic tip. But my tip is don't apply with, you know, oh, I want, to, I want to get a job in private equity, even though right now I work in Teach for America, and there's no way I'm going to get that private equity job. I want you to apply with the strongest career vision possible that will maximize your chances of getting accepted. And then once you get into school, you can try to figure it out. That's my take on it. Because no one is going to chase you down on graduation day and waving a copy of your admissions essay in their hands and saying, wait a minute, you said you were going to work in pharmaceuticals and instead you're going into consumer electronics products. What's happening? Give me back that, give me back that diploma right now. Like, no, nobody's going to care. Once you're accepted, nobody's going to care. So apply with the strongest career vision possible. And what's one of the ways to get a strong career vision? I want you to do some homework. I want you to especially do homework on that post MBA career. I want you to figure out how feasible it is. And the more, the bigger the change you're selling to that business school, you know, the bigger that sort of change that you're pitching, the more research you need to do to prove to them that you can, in fact, get that job, right? The burden of proof is on you that you can get the job. You can't just think to yourself, well, they'll just assume that it's possible. They will not assume that it's possible. You have to prove that you can get it. And the way that you do this is, first of all, you need to really understand the market that you're going into. Uh, so make sure that you start educating yourself on market trends, you know, read the magazines and the, and the websites that cover the market trends for your, for your potential career, uh, for your future career. But I also want you to really do a ton of informational interviews. And in these informational interviews, basically what you're going to say is you're going to send over a copy of your resume beforehand and you're going to then get on the phone and you're going to say to them look i want to have the job that you have you know you went to an mba program and now you're working for amazon and i want to work for amazon someday do you think that if i were to get an mba i could get hired and if the person tells you no by the way if you do a ton of these informational interviews and the people tell you no then maybe you should reconsider what it is you want to do after business school um but if these people tell you yes, that's perfect. That is something super valuable that you can start to drop into, you can start to drop into your essays. So for example, here's how this would look in a real application essay. I spoke with three product managers at Amazon who all said that my background, when combined with an MBA, makes me a compelling candidate. Right? So all of a sudden, now I as the reader, am I feeling more relieved? Of course. 
now I, instead of saying like, oh, product management, I don't know if that person can get a job in product management, like teach for America school teachers. How is, how is she going to go from being a school teacher to being a product manager? Well, guess what? I spoke with three people who are product managers and they all said that I'd be able to, you know, once I get the MBA, I'll be able to, to get this job. Whew. Now I, as the admissions reader, I no longer have the stress around, oh my gosh, are we going to be able to get this person this job? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be mad at us? Et cetera, et cetera. Ideally, you'll be able to find your resume twin. And what I mean by your resume twin is ideally someone who whose pre-MBA uh, career path looked exactly like yours or as close to possible as yours. And those are the people, it, once they get an MBA, and if they have that post MBA job that you want, these are the ideal people to reach out to, right? So start searching for these people now on LinkedIn, because it's going to take you some time to find these resume twins. It's going to take you some time to reach out to them and then set up the call. So that's why I want you to start doing this now. So that way you'll be able to have that powerful quote in your in your application that proves to me as the reader that your um, career vision actually is feasible. Moving on to recommendations. Uh, if you don't know this yet, uh, you are going to need usually two letters of recommendation from people who have supervised your work. So I want you to start preparing now for your recommendations. I want you to start thinking about who your recommenders might be. And by now, I mean, like as soon as tomorrow. Um, and why start now, Maria? The deadlines are still, you know, I'm not applying until round two. I still have nine months. Well, right now there's still time to course correct, especially to improve upon a weakness. So what do I mean by this? <clears throat> well, a lot of the, um, the recommendation forms ask specifically, what is a area of weakness for the candidate? And what has the candidate do to improve upon the weakness? If you wait until two weeks prior to the deadline to ask your recommender for the recommendation, and then you say to them, by the way, what do you think one of my weaknesses is? And they say, oh my gosh, your time, you know, you're great. I, I you know, I, I'm so happy with the work that you do, but your time management skills are just abysmal. I've always wished that you would be better at them then there's not going to be this improvement story. Then in the recommendation, they're just going to say, I really wish her time and her time management skills were better. And then the story would end there. Instead, if you know now what they think your weaknesses are, if you ask them now, what can I be doing better around here so that you start to find out what they think your weaknesses are, now you have time, you have months to improve upon that weakness. And then the narrative in their recommendation form is not gonna be she's bad at time management. The narrative is now gonna be she used to be bad at time management, but then she read a book from such and such author and ever since then she has been amazing. So that's the narrative that you want that part of the applicate of the recommendation to have. So how are you gonna know what your weaknesses are you know, you might not know what they are. So I want you to start to find out pretty much as soon as possible. Here's a tip. I want you to Google the term GMAC common recommendation. What that's going to do is that's going to pull up a PDF of the recommendation form that a number of schools use. So once you read that recommendation form, that's going to start to give you a sense of the sorts of questions and the dimensions upon across which you're going to be judged. The other reason I want you to start thinking about who your recommender is going to be is that you can always pull an all-nighter, right? If it's if it's the uh, if it, let's say it's the night before the deadline, and maybe you've been procrastinating a little bit, and you're suddenly like, oh my gosh, I need to finish this essay. If you have to, it's not ideal, but if you have to, you can pull an all-nighter. But you can never force your recommender to pull an all-nighter right? So you need to give your recommender at least a month's notice, if not more, if ideally two months notice that these recommendations are going to be due because you never know what if you, you're like, okay, I'm going to ask them a few weeks before. I'm going to ask them a few weeks before. And then you don't know if they're going to suddenly go on holiday or go on a vacation or suddenly they might even quit the company. And then you'll have to hunt them down and it's going to be a huge pain. So, and these are all three things that have happened to people I've worked with in the past where they've waited too long to ask for the recommendation. 
and you know then the recommender isn't available and then there's panic and tears and stress so you can avoid that by getting started soon by the way once you do identify your recommender and you do ask them to to recommend you um tell them that the deadline for the recommendation is actually a week earlier just so that way you know they'll be gunning for that earlier time and if they forget or if they don't have time guess what whew the good news is like you're still submitting that recommendation on time now, one of the things I want you to do is you might not know if your boss or supervisor actually supports your quest for the MBA. This can be a really delicate balancing act. Like frequently people will say, my gosh, Maria, if I tell my boss that I'm going to go get an MBA, then I'm totally going to miss out on this promotion that I'm up for or you know, they might get really angry with me. And so if, if your boss does not support you getting an MBA, I would caution you against using that person then as your recommender because they might even subconsciously uh, torpedo your chances if they end up writing then sort of a lukewarm recommendation, right? So you need to find out, do they support MBAs in general? Um, some managers out in the world, especially those that don't have MBAs, they like to scoff at the MBA, right? They like to say, ha, huh, MBAs, that's a waste of time. Um, so if your boss is one of those people, guess what? Don't ask them for a recommendation because it's not going to be, it's not going to be passionate. It's not going to sparkle. It's going to be a little more lackluster, even if they really like you. Um, do they support you getting an MBA? Heck, do they like you in general? So you need to find out now if they support you. So that way, if they do not support you or if you realize, oh, my gosh, I cannot ask my boss for a recommendation, you need to start thinking about who's another senior leader in the company that you can ask to be your recommender. And if you don't have one, guess what? You're going to use the next six to nine months to start currying favor <laughs> with someone who's senior in your company. So that way you do have a good recommendation uh, at that time. So here's a stealthy way to try to find out if, you're, if your boss, if you're like, I don't know, Maria, how do I even figure out if my boss recommends, you know, likes MBAs or not? Here's a stealthy way to do it. You could say, hey, you know what? I, I read this article and there's this cool MBA program. Do you know that there's an MBA program out there that has a major just devoted to marketing analytics? It has all these classes that are just devoted to analytics, specifically in marketing. How cool is that? Right. If you say something like that and if your boss is like, well, MBAs, they're worthless. They don't know what they're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Then hmm, maybe you need to start looking for somebody else. Now, if your boss does have an MBA, you need to figure out if they support you getting an MBA. So you can sort of casually say to them like, hey, you know, you have an MBA and I just I've always really admired the way that you conduct yourself in negotiations. You know, I wish that I could be as good at negotiating as you are. Um, did you think that your MBA helped you because I might want to get an MBA also to you know, so that I can be as good as you are in whatever it is now? If they say, like, no, the MBA was total waste of time and I'm still paying off my student loans and it was terrible, then again, you know that they're probably not great. If they say, oh, I loved my MBA, yes, and, and I wish you should totally do it too because it's great, then you've got a good piece of data that this is probably a good person to ask for your recommendation. Um, we're almost done. Uh, so extra leadership, the good news about being on this webinar today is that it is not too late for you to take it up a notch. So at work, I want you to, again, this week, I want you to start volunteering to take on extra responsibilities. Ask around, what else could I be doing around here? How else could I be helping? What, what could I be doing better? Right. Or you could propose something that's new or better. Hey, guys, you know, I was wondering, we always do whenever we're recruiting interns, we always do it X. What if we did it Y? And that's going to give you enough time to try to actually make these changes happen and therefore take your leadership experiences up a notch so that your essays will be stronger and your recommendations will be stronger. Now, if you do have sort of a, a commitment to a certain community service or something like, you know, something in your community like a church or a synagogue or a sports team or something like that, try to step it up a notch in, in that realm as well. Um, ideally, this is something quantifiable. So that way on your resume, you'll be able to put something like, oh, I, I, I led a volunteer recruitment drive and we were able to recruit 15% more volunteers than the previous year. Or I led a fundraiser and we raised 20% more dollars than we had the year before, right? So that tells me as a reader, 
like, wow, this person really, they really, you know, they like to take control of things. They're, they're good leaders and they're actually effective leaders because they were, look at how they quantified their, their um, contribution. I will say though, if you do not currently do a lot with community service, my advice and not everyone agrees with me on this, but this is just my take on it. Don't start suddenly volunteering for five different things six months before you apply. I believe that admissions officers see through that. And if they see through it, then what's the point? So I don't think you should do it. And finally, when it is time to write the essays, uh, we could do an entire webinar just on essays by itself. I have like an hour and a half webinar <laughs> that, I, that I've done at other times that is just essay stuff. Um, but I, I did want to leave you with this final thought because we are still sort of six months out, six to nine months out. When you are sitting down to write your essays, stories are always better than statements that say, I am blank. So don't say, I am an inspiring team leader. I am a supportive manager. I am the sort of person who does blah, 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 because those statements are very empty without concrete proof. So instead, I want you to tell me a story about a time you were those things. You need to show the reader that that's the sort of person that you are. Instead of saying, this is the sort of person that I am, prove it to me by telling me a story that shows you being that type of a person. So now my final tip for you of this webinar is yes, even now, several months in advance or even years ahead of applying, keep a running list somewhere of your brainstormed stories of potential anecdotes. And I call it in Applicant Lab, I call it the evidence the evidence you're going to use to prove to the admissions committee that you're a dynamic leader who gets things done. So that way you don't have to say it. You sh you're showing them by proving it to them. So if you are interested in signing up for Applicant Lab, I do have a So please do take advantage of it quickly. And thank you. And now with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dave. Thank you so much, Maria. That was great. And uh, I also really just want to remind you guys also of our special offer, which I mentioned at the very top. So just for being with us for this hour, we want to offer you guys 20% off any of our GMAT courses. We have a few different ones. Go to our site and look and $50 off the GMAT itself. An exam voucher, this is a special offer. We do not usually offer this. Um, and it's for the next 48 hours. So just go to examtile.com slash GMAT and you will be able to take us up on this offer. Um, whoever just asked, we will send out the video of this afterwards. So if you missed any of, any of our words, you will be able to uh, review it. And um, that's really it. So uh, from us here at ExamPal and from uh, Maria as well, I'm sure we just want to say thank you, you guys, for being with us. Uh, I'm going to stick around here for a few more minutes in the chat to answer any questions you guys may have. Um, and that's it. I hope to see you guys on ExamPal soon. So uh, have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Thanks for being with us.